Welcome to Chai with Ping. This is Ping Robert. In this podcast, I cover immigrant stories, cross-cultural experiences, and minority issues. Join me with a cup of chai and take a listen. Welcome back to Chai with Ping. Hi, everyone. Today is a special episode. The interviewer is today's interviewee. <laughs> so it is my chance to ask questions. Thanks for all the listeners to ask those questions to Ping, and I'm the one who's usually answering all her questions. So today I will ask the questions. And I have been told that there are stories that I have not even heard yet. So I'm excited to hear them for the first time. And don't forget to subscribe to Ping on or wherever you listen to podcasts. Rate her, give her five stars on. Apple Podcast and Spotify. Yes. So let's dive into today's episode. All right. Thank you, Louis. I don't think everyone got your name yet, but my name is Ping, and this is the husband, Louis. <laughs> and thank you so much for being my interviewer.、Uh, we're gonna talk about、uh, freelancing medical interpretation. That one of the jobs I've done in the U.S. First question is, why did you start being a freelancing interpreter? So why did I start being a medical interpreter?、Um, I didn't specifically go into the industry to be a medical interpreter, but that was the the one option that opened、uh, during twenty eighteen for me.、Uh, one of the church couple they told me that, oh, you know, you speak very well English. You should become an interpreter. We do it part time for our jobs, and then we love it.、Uh, we'll go to the Hospital and then take clients and interpret for them and sometimes we just drive in one car and come back together so it's a very, it's an easy flexible scheduling so it suits my scheduling as a student and also a part time worker, and so I started looking into that program at that time the agency that they were working at it was Colorado Language Connection. So if you're outside of Colorado or outside of U.S., you might need to check your local policies or some of the guidelines for interpretation. Because、mm. in Colorado, there are looser regulations for interpretations because I guess it's just diversity and also the needs is smaller. So they don't have like a requirement for tests or、um, certification, but they require a forty-hour training as medical interpreters. So.、Nice. So I went to CLC. I signed it up.、Um, the price at that time was about five hundred fifty. It was pretty, like it's it's a pretty big payment for me at that time. And I think I spent two weekends, four days together on weekends, and then we got together. It was a very beautiful, cute cohort, about fifteen people all together, and we had a trainer. Actually, her story is also on my podcast. So her name is Aggie. I'll put the link below.、Um, so she trained us. Throughout the entire weekend, and then actually the material was given by the federal government. So、um, it, the training was called、uh, bridging the gap in medical interpretation training. So it was forty hours for me at that time, but right now I think they increased it to sixty hours. So do you think that money you spend and time you spend that during the initial stages was worth it? Um, that was one of my questions. I actually emailed Aggie asking like how how long should I work until I actually make that five hundred fifty back. She didn't reply back to me. And now I'm thinking I I I felt like it was very silly asking that question because no one knows depending on the frequency and all that. So right now looking back, it it's twenty twenty two. I definitely feel it's worth it, and also it gave it kind of opened up a whole door. For a career in front of me, yeah, and it also gives you professional knowledge that how to keep the whole interpretation standard for all the other interpreters in the region or the area, right? Yes. Nice. Do you do you want to hear how the training was done briefly? <laughs> Sure. <laughs> so, so you know, we have maybe multiple languages, maybe like ten languages in the room, right? So there is no way that each language will be covered. So、mm-hmm. the whole training, bridging the gap, training was conducted in English, and all the materials were given in English.、Uh, basically, it's kind of like a medical lesson for us to know. Body parts and you know, like for example, systems in our body, and then related 
a uh, terminology that we will use. And then some of the lesson is talking about how to be an interpreter. It's not just being a a a language person. You know, some people don't interpret the tones and the attitude and all that. And also, there are some ethical or、um, code of ethics. Was mentioned in the class, and then、um, so there were so very heavily sections on、uh, the body parts and the systems in our body. So basically, we're relearning all the terms of which part that we have to. For example, the eyes. There are so many different parts, right? And then different organs in our body, and so we have to familiarize with that. For me, some of the English terms are very difficult because I never went through the doctor, the medical terms in English. But most of them I know it in Mandarin, so I just have to make up for the English part. But for some people, they probably grew up here, and then their target language is the, is their heritage language. So, for example,、uh, if an Indian、uh, Hindi speaker growing up here, they probably need to freshen up in their Hindi because some of the terminologies they would never. Uh, using their daily life, and then so at the end of the training, we took a exam.、Uh, we will do pre,、uh, like a presentation thing, so role play and all that kind of try to perform how it is exactly well, very similarly、uh, conducted in the clinic room.、Um, but also we will take a written test. There's no spoken or verbal test, so the written test was like multiple questions and then. Uh, I I wouldn't think it was very hard. If we study over those two weekends, we can totally、uh, nail it. So yeah, after that they send us the、uh, certificate, then we can start looking for agencies to collaborate with. Yeah, you touched a very important point there that、uh, just because you are good at your first language or you can speak and hear and understand doesn't really make you a good interpreter,、mm-hmm. especially a pro. Yeah. Because、uh, if you're working in medical field as an interpreter or even translating some documents, then you do need to get some terminology. Even in your own language, you might not be familiar with some terms.、Mm-hmm. So you need to do the homework. You need to learn those terms in your own language and also the language you're interpreting it. Too. You're right. Also, at the end of the training,、uh, some of the agencies will provide the glossaries in different languages. So, for example, I got a little booklet of、uh, Chinese, both in simplifying traditional Chinese characters.、Um, I, I would say I haven't used it a lot because a lot of terms happening in the hospital and in the clinics are not fully there in the glossary. Well. Hmm. Let let me put it this way. It's like it's so many words in the glossary, and then not all of them will use it. And so the appointments I have been to, usually they only convey like easy conversations. So I, I haven't found uh the need that I have to go back to glossary and refresh my memories. But it is not saying that we don't need to. It's just like right now, my experience haven't encountered to that difficult level yet. Okay, so are you saying that you know is it also because the doctors when they're explaining the the situation to the patient they also want to keep it in as simple as possible in layman term that people can actually understand it. That's does, right. Does that help you? Yeah, yeah, that's that's right. So in our training, it also said that all the medical providers. Oh yeah, and it's very important here to understand the U.S. system. Like they don't call only doctors.、Um, All of those people, like nurses or medical technicians or doctors, they're all called medical providers. So that's just one general term. So medical providers, they are trained to use about fifth grade, so it's about eleven years old、uh, English level to explain things to the patients. Oh, nice. <laughs> so, so、um, it, because like thinking about immigrant families, so if we don't think from an immigrant point of view. Even like a regular family with English native speakers, a lot of mer- medical terms are very new, right? Because not a, all of the people have gone to medical school. So if they're talking about、uh, a very serious issue with your stomach, I think a doctor will say the whole term, but then they will、uh, explain what it means and then why it happens and how you need to take care of it. So I think it sometimes it's not about the language; it's also about the knowledge. And then, vice versa, when you turn into 
uh, the immigrant situation. Some of them might not be as educated as all the medical providers, so they have to kind of lower down the level of the language itself and to explain more thoroughly about what that illness or what the symptoms or the cause are. Thanks for sharing all these uh, information and tips about getting into interpretation, especially your stories. Mm. I hope your listeners are enjoying it and <laughs> staying tuned. I like this next question, whoever asked that, it's cool. What are some memorable stories that happened to you? Um, I will start with the the first time I was working with an agency, the which the name will be Remain Silent. Um, I I signed up for that collaboration, and then they sent over some of the contracts for me, and then I had to go to the company to sign the, the documents. And then so the first uh, first time I went in, I've never been into an agency, right? So I went there, and then there were so many different national flags, and then it's just the whole decoration is beautiful. And I was fascinated, so I took my phone and took some pictures. It's like, yeah, this is like a, for my first job ever on the interpretation uh, industry. And then all of a sudden, there was like a staff coming, running out to me. It's like, what are you doing? You're not allowed to take any pictures. And so I was like in shock. I was like, uh... Uh, I don't know. It's just very beautiful and I'm very excited. This is my first job over here. So that's why I'm taking a picture. There's no, nothing like, you know, like secrecy or I'm, I'm not trying to steal any ideas of that, that company's layout. And then so they asked me to take out my phone and delete the picture. So, you know, that was a very bad impression at first. And then we sat down and we signed the contract and we talk about price and all that. Um, after two weeks working with them, I was still waiting for the contract to be signed because I signed my copy, right? And then I, in like, I was trying to confirm if I would get a signed documents because at the same time I was uh, signing contracts with other agencies and they immediately sent back their copy. So after two, three weeks, I was working with this company and then I just never got it. So I emailed them twice saying that, you know, hey, I'm still waiting over here. I really want to familiarize with the policy or the restriction that you have. Um, is there any way that you're going to send me the, the digital copy? So for me to refresh my memory with, because I there are like maybe 10 pages that I signed, right? Mm -hmm. So no one actually responded. So the third email I wrote to them is like, you know, I, I've been working with you guys for this time and I still didn't get my signed document, like the contract thingy. Um, so I think I'm gonna take a pause until I, re I receive those documents because I don't think this is legal for me to work under, like outside of the contract. And then so immediately after five minutes that the owner of the business called me and, and she just said that, you know, uh, right here we have a lawyer who's working for our company also present, so uh, we can have a conversation now. And I was like, even more scared because I'm like, wow, why is it so serious? And then she kept saying, you know, um, she fear, she doesn't think sending the contract documents is their job. Like I should have taken the pictures on my own, but I was like trying to explain, uh, yes, I can take the picture of my own, but you guys didn't sign a contract. So I still don't have the signed contract from their side. And they, so she just kind of shut me down saying that, you know, well, miss, if you don't uh, agree with our protocols, we're not gonna work together and it's better that we separate our ways. And I was like, even in more shock, I was like, I really want to work with you guys because at that time that this company, I think still is in Colorado, it's one of the bigger agencies for interpretation. So that means, you know, more hours, more clients and more appointments, right? And so I was hoping that I can start there and then go for other agencies. But then this is not really a great start. So they kind of just hastily uh, disconnect the phone call, just saying that, you know, we, we shouldn't be working together. And then we can probably reassess after six months if I really want to work with them. And at that time, I don't know if you were in the car, but like my brother and my mom were in a car. So they were also hearing that kind of tone and different, um, different atmosphere in the car. So we started talking about that. It's just very confusing for me it, because it's like the first agency that I worked with and signed with, it ended up 
in a very sad situation. Thanks for sharing that. I think that was quite an experience to be the first one. And I respect you not sharing the name of the company uh, on this platform. But I, I do remember part of it, the whole story. And so it's, it's crazy that they make you sign the documents. They don't give you a copy of that document. And they refuse to sign or show any proof that they have also acknowledged what you have signed. You followed them for three times. And after... And after you said that, you know, this is not legal is when they hastily call you back and kind of threaten you that, you know, there's a lawyer in the room and you can discuss right now. Mm. It's just, I guess, I don't know. It's not, in my understanding, a great way of doing a business mm. just because you're already established doesn't mean that you don't play fair with new um, people or new employees or contractors you're working with. So, yeah, I guess I'm glad that, you know, you're not part of that organization, but I'm also really happy for you that you are a successful interpreter. You could do it without that particular company. You have so many other clients now. You have been working, getting clients, helping people. Mm. And, yeah, it's it's great. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Want some more stories? Yeah, let's hear some more stories. There are so many appointments I have taken over the four years in the course of this, this time, right? And there were some of the appointments that really struck my heart. For example, um, there is one very famous like physical therapy for a uh, hospital for brain and spinal injuries. And when I walked in, I was not really sure why the appointment was so long. It was from 8 to 4 p.m. Uh, it's the whole day um, but then I realized that okay this hospital is more for like physical therapy and all that I went into the room the the ward and then I saw a you know, very beautiful young girl like Asian face almost Chinese face um, and then I started asking questions like what's going on and so throughout the course of time that um, I was working with them I realized okay this this little girl is just freshman in college from California they moved here just because of her physical uh, therapy. She ran into a car accident, so kind of uh, injured her spine. And so from her waist down, she was paralyzed. She couldn't walk and she couldn't do, you know, potty on her own. So they, they were trying to train the parents. And also the parents were divorced, so they will come different days. They won't meet each other. Um, so they trained the parents separately to show them how to transport the girl from the bed to the uh, wheelchair or to the bathroom, to the wheelchair and to the bed. So there are so many different techniques. I, I really learned a lot through looking at them. But also at the same time, I, I felt the intensity of that accident and also, you know, the tension in the family. That the girl is not really happy. I've never seen her smile. And she's such a beautiful girl. Like in her ward, there were pictures of her high school and maybe college. And then there were full of like Asian snacks, which I also know. So when I saw them, it's like, oh, the Chinese snacks. They were all in the room, but she was not happy. And then the parents were not happy. I think they, they, move, they speak Cantonese, actually. So they moved from China to California trying to find a better life. But it's just such a tragedy happened to the family. And... The dad didn't show a lot of emotions, but, but the mom kind of on the side, you know, she she shared, it's like, I don't, well, I don't really know why this is happening. Like, she's off to college the first year, but she didn't even finish the her first semester and got into the accident. So for me, it's just like looking at her and also she could not control her body, right? So her bowel movement or pee, everything requires people to uh, take care of her. And so for me, it's just like, it's very humbling to see a person who's probably a little younger than me, well, a lot younger than me, but um, just having a very big drastic change in life. And um, it's just like, I also see the fragility of life because it's like, wow, how much it will change. Also, they were talking about making changes in the in the on the floor or the stairs and all that, building a ramp for the girl when they move to dad's house or mom's house and all that. And it's just, 
I'm I'm also wondering, you know, because they have the money and probably the insurance to cover them to be here for therapy, but there are so many other people who couldn't access that healthcare as well. So this is one old story. And I'll tell you another one. This one is also so I work with Mandarin Chinese speaking clients. So of course. Mo- most of them are from China. Yeah. Like very minimum are from Taiwan because of the population. Um, so I went into the uh, room. I didn't know what appointment is. Usually it, the agency wouldn't tell us what appointment is about. Mm-hmm. Maybe the department, but sometimes not. So I don't really know what to expect. I went into a room, so the nurse practitioner came in. Um, so this is the, the client is like a professor for singing. I guess he's like in a called opera singing industry mm-hmm. and then he also teaches and then his wife was there and so the nurse started saying what the results are from their previous biopsy mm-hmm. and so i was like trying to grasp the, the context of that because i didn't have enough time to talk to the nurse beforehand and slowly slowly when she was talking about the things when they are pointing some pictures and some documents mm-hmm. i realized the nurse is trying to tell them uh the biopsy results show there was some tumor which is not benign so it's it's bad but the professor couldn't understand so he was asking questions like, um, I think maybe that's just a different angle would you think that could be a possibility that the picture was taken wrong at that wrong angle or you know maybe the teacher was not extracted deep enough to see if it's benign or not and the nurse practitioner very patiently explained the same thing again to him and then at the end she kind of uh, proposed like uh, we don't really think this is wrong uh, but it's better that we start planning for our therapy and treatment to stop the tumor grow- from growing and the professor still couldn't believe it um, so at that time i realized maybe just him not wanting to admit that he's having cancer because his wife next to him is like looking really, really stern and serious as well. So then the nurse practitioner kept saying this third time of the whole explanation. And then the professor is just like, well, is there anyone else I can talk to? Like maybe call the doctor because I, I don't think you're a doctor. And so the nurse said, that's right. I'm a pr- nurse practitioner, but I will call the doctor for you. The doctor came in and brought like a piece of paper and started drawing and saying that, well, your biopsy shows that you have tumor and then that's a sign of cancer. So it's right here at the esophagus. So it's like, you know, where you need to eat and drink. So we probably need to get to radiation or chemotherapy. Our recommendation is to do combine. And so the professor was like, I think he was also shocked. She, he couldn't believe what, what was happening in that room. So the doctor kind of, a little bit forcefully just jump into the discussion. It's like, all right, so this is the timeline we will suggest you to take. Uh, maybe two weeks later after your health uh, examination came out, we can do chemo and then this is how long it's going to be for your radiation and how this is going to help you. And so he was very patiently draw the picture of like how many times it's going to hit the the area and then how much of percentage cancer cells will be removed. So then I walked out from that clinic thinking, what did I just witness? It almost felt like a dream because it is such a big news to release to somebody. But I can also see that professor was not really believing in. And maybe it was hard for him. But for me, it's just like I never know how they're going to uh, digest the whole, whole story in the news and how they're going to face it. And I think one of the tricky part of being a medical and freelancer interpreter is that we don't always get to see the same patients. So not until like one year later, I saw that patient again, but in between they never requested me or I just didn't happen to be uh, available for their appointments. So after a whole year I met him, he like, I, I think he lost half of his, his body fat. 
So he was so skinny, and then he's just like he said, "Hey, I know you. Okay, little sister, come, come, come." And then the memea. So so that's how they call me, right? The little sister. It's like yeah. I say, "Wow, you look great. You lost so much weight." And then he said, "Yeah, right now everything's clear. You see, like I'm I lost weight. This is like a very loose T-shirt, and I'm here for another checkup, follow up because I have to do it every every month." And so they he he went in and um just did that check up and everything and said so they say yeah everything looked great and then so when he opened up his chest because they have to measure the uh, heart rate and all that I saw a big cross I was like oh um what's up with that big cross and then he's like oh you know what it's like oh praise the to the to the Lord of the sky it's like God really saved me without God I cannot survive I'm like oh so it, it, are your family also Christian and it's like yeah my wife pray for me so much and then they at work and they pray for me and all that so so it's just like very interesting to see someone change their beliefs also during this course mm. um and and the third time I saw the guy uh, it's all probably after six months or so from the second one mm. and I met them It's like oh, I'm here to, to do another follow up checkup right 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 now the tumor is in remission so um, uh, We went in and the nurse said that and and they're in the, all of the appointments are in different hospitals I think they follow the doctor so the doctor has appointment in different areas um, the nurse told them again. It's like we are sorry to tell you, uh, but we think that tumor is coming back. And at that time, I, you know, we, we were so happy, right? Six months ago. But then after six months, like, okay, so what are we doing? We need to talk about uh, therapy plans and, and radiation or chemo and all that. So I step out of the room. Still, <laughs> there's always a lot of reflection time after I, I leave the room. It's just like, wow, that you you seem to care and control so much of your health and your body. But when the tumor cells came back, it just came back. No matter how much therapy they do. And then it just came back. Um, and, you know, why does this so important for the professor? Because he sings for life. That's his career. So without, you know, that esophagus and, and the whole pipe, working well then he cannot really work and then i feel like he he probably has 10 more years before he he retires so then it's just like a lot of human emotions happening in the hospitals as well thanks for sharing that that was pretty heavy i hope the professor and his family are doing well and what i i hear from this story is that you know even though it's doing interpretation but it's tough for you to go through all these emotions because they are real people. You are a person. You're not just a computer, mm. or, you know, Google Translate. Yeah. <laughs> you are uh, sharing some of those feelings and you reflect on the situation mm. even if you don't really want to. And so that comes with the job. Yeah. Yeah. And a lot of times it's not just about language, right? We sometimes need to be uh, like a, we we can we can be the language conduit, so we kind of serve as a channel for language A to language B, but we also need to be cultural advocate. Um, in some of the situation, when I see the patients are not getting through uh, some of the responses from the medical provider, I do need to step in a little bit. It's like um, interpreter would like to say maybe there's a cultural differences that perhaps are explaining this way they can understand a little bit more otherwise it's just like repetition for like three to four times there is another patient that i saw which is very surprising so it, i went back to the what is it pt hospital again and this time i opened the door i saw a white guy <laughs> i was like oh a white guy speaking Mandarin? I was not expecting that. So then we kind of greeted each other and then realizing, yes, he's also half body paralyzed from waist down. And my job at, on that day is to call his Chinese wife in California, put her and himself on a video call because the physical therapist or one of the nurse is gonna show the wife how to clean after he's done his bathroom. So I was standing there, I heard that whole thing, I was like, uh, 
am I gonna see your private parts? <laughs> and then the guy is like, oh, come on, you guys are all medical, you know, medical professionals, right? Like, you guys haven't seen enough. And I was like, uh, no, I don't really work here. It's my job is for language and interpretation. So I'm not sure if I really want to see someone else's private part. And then so, so the nurse heard that the nurse is a, a male nurse. So he put on his gloves and then saying, well, ma'am, you can probably just stand over there and while I do the thing. And then so the, but the white guy just kept calling, well, miss, you can come, you can hold the phone. You, you can talk to my wife, the wife, my wife speak Mandarin. And then so I, I saw the wife on the phone and the nurse kind, kind of uh, came to say to the guy, it's like, well, you know, she's an interpreter, so she, we can just use a phone holder and the phone can be on the on the floor and then she can stand on the other side so she doesn't have to see everything happening right and then the but the guy didn't understand it so at that time i was like never mind i'm just going to go in because it's like there is there's no point i have to explain myself and how this practice is done sure i'm an interpreter interpreter i shouldn't be holding your phone but you know i can just be a helpful person in the room so i held the phone and then we uh, went to the back of his uh, wheelchair and then kind of put him on a little toilet seat thingy and then they kind of elevated the whole uh, wheelchair and then so the nurse started saying well ma'am you need to do this you, you need to put a stool softener into your husband's anal and then after 30 minutes like the the stool will come out and so I know well this is a disclaimer it's gonna be a little disgusting if you want to skip this story you can totally go to the next sections so it's like, and then so he, when he was explaining, and then the wife was very emotionless on the phone. I can see her because I was holding the phone. So I was professionally interpreting everything to her. And then the nurse started saying, well, then you will have, this is the difficult and tricky part because, you know, patients like your husband cannot control their bowel movement. So you will need to stick your finger to their butt and then try to active. And I was like, my <laughs> my heart was like, oh my god, what did I just go into? Um, but I still interpreted the whole thing, and then he just started saying, well, how you're gonna, you know, uh, put your finger circled ten times, and then all that, and then the stool will come out, and then you need to catch it with a little pee pad on the on the floor. After it's done, and then you need to wipe it, and then still put your finger to to check if there's any leftover poop in the butt. So I just interpret everything. And then after that, I was like, whew, I need a mental break. <laughs> that is so, so much. And it's so intimate, right? I never expected the whole appointment would go like that. Uh, the white guy was like, hey, honey, how do you think? Did you learn all that? Because he couldn't see anything and he didn't feel anything with his butt, right? So then he doesn't really know what's happening. He only heard things. The wife still emotionless is like, yeah, what else can I do? It, it's just like, you know, there's a lot of re reluctance and also he, she's almost like resigned because she couldn't do any more to change the situation but mm. to help her husband. Mm. And it's just a little... I I felt like my heart was like sque squeezed a little bit because it's like, wow, I can sense there is a family dynamic here. The husband is half paralyzed and then the wife is gonna take care of him till the end of the life right so it's just like i don't really know how much love i will have left if i have to do that every day i'm sorry <laughs> right isn't it hard don't you think it sounds hard so <laughs> this is i guess one of the stories that i probably didn't hear completely i think i do remember a little bit of it but maybe i asked you to just skip <laughs> <laughs> now eventually still heard that <laughs> yeah so well i feel for you and i mean i feel for the whole um situation for the wife and and for the husband too it it's it's a lot for both of them emotionally mm -hmm. and going through all that but yeah thanks for sharing the story you get to work with these people and share these stories with us without you know technically taking their names mm. i hope they're doing well but i just feel like you know we can't take things for granted and yeah love needs effort and hard work not as much in some cases or mm. i i maybe 
it's just different the way we have to take care of our loved ones in yeah. different scenarios mm. so you are a pro now uh, medical practitioner i think i'm okay i don't really think i'm so pro because there are still terms terminologies that i don't know and and sometimes i could be impatient or like just it, it is not as easy for myself to digest a lot of information um there was this one grandpa and i i arrived to this hospital it's mainly also for like spinal injuries but it's not for therapy it's for more, more for like injection and treatment so this this grandpa i don't know why he had to do that injection but after that whole injection i realized oh okay he spoke cantonese but luckily his grandson was with me so so it's so interesting that they they request the Mandarin interpreter, but they speak Cantonese. So the grandson is in the middle. So from Cantonese to Mandarin and to English, and then we back and forth to to do the whole thing. Um, the why this grandpa is so interesting is that it remind he reminded me of my own yeye because my yeye and I, my grandparents, my paternal grandparents, they 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 also speak um. Cantonese while I was growing up so I can understand a bit more than a regular Taiwanese will understand but it's just seeing him on the on, on the bed it makes me feel like oh because my yeah yeah at that time was also not feeling doing well and they were probably around the same age after the surgery so they had the injection and then the injection to the spinal cord hurts a lot so usually they will have the whole body well half body anesthesia is it the right word? <laughs> <laughs> Not a medical bro either. <laughs> but yeah, it sounds like one of those. <laughs> Anesthesia. Yeah, anyways, I... Well, I'll put the right spelling in the episode now. Sorry. This this word always kind of bothers me because I don't always remember how to say, say it. So then after that, it will take about 30 minutes of break to kind of wake up and then eat something, drink something because from the night before, they wouldn't eat or drink anything. Um... In, because they don't want the patients to puke anything. And that could, you know, block their um, air pipe and all that during the surgery, right? So that that's the risk. So this grandpa woke, woke up and ate something and he started complaining about his pain in the legs. And so the nurse gave, gave him some medication. Usually it's morphine, right? So like injected into the IV. And then after an hour, he's still very painful, and then he complained again. So now the the nurse came came back and then gave him another injection. After thirty minutes, he's like, it's still very very painful. I cannot take it. It's like, is there anything else that you can can do? Where's the doctor? And so the nurse, I realized that when the nurse was discussing that, it's like the doctor was not in the building. After the whole surgery, he was gone. And and for me, it's like what. <laughs> The doctor is not in the building, and but the patient is still here. Like, who's gonna take care of them? So, because they are, tra I, I think they're called like traveling doctors. They go for appointments to appointment in different hospitals. So they call the doctor and to see if there's anything else to, they can do. But they still didn't quite find out why uh, the grandpa's legs were uh, paining. So the grandpa just kept repeating the whole thing. Is that like, what kind of hospital is this? Like, how professional are you guys? Like, how come the doctor is not here? And then like, what what guys? What can you give me to to uh, release the pain and all that? So he he became very grumpy. And then I have to repeat again and again to the nurse as interpreter. Even <laughs> so, even though they they couldn't do anything more because the morphine doses are already enough to the body that he can stand but just the whole thing and looking at him and then so the surgery was only supposed to be two hours my appointment was scheduled for only two hours but then it lasted for about six hours wow. and in the evening i had to go like it was like what three four p.m i had to go hmm. so i just told them that i cannot stay but you know it's grandpa and grandson is gonna stay so they're like oh maybe we'll just call another interpreter and it's just like very difficult situation because like last minute on call interpreters are not easy to find, especially the uh, agency I was working with. They don't have as many Mandarin and Cantonese interpreters at that time. So that always kept me wondering like how that grandpa uh, 
later become like how how he was you know after that day i hope he's feeling better but it's just like a lot of lingering thoughts were there in the in the uh, appointments so also kind of let me to think about if, if i age in the future and what kind of life and quality i will want for my health and for my life interesting I'll... so all these sessions or appointments of interpretation mm. has a totally different story thank you for sharing some of those with me and with your listeners i think it's also uh you know kind of a realization for me that how important it is for us to take care of our health not just for our own self but also that we don't have to over depend on our partners for care so and you have so many spinal injury patient stories mm. so uh, just a reminder that I should always protect my back when I'm riding my motorcycle. I think I'll just always use the back protector and mm. all the other gears to stay safe. I and mean, hopefully I never have to use them, but yeah, yeah. better be safe than sorry. Mm-hmm. Any last thoughts you want to share with your listeners today i think these stories you know were really interesting and meaningful that we got to hear from you especially in the medical interpretation world uh, and i think there could be a lot more stories in non-medical interpretation field we might have another episode for those in the future and thanks for taking care of these people and also you know going through all these emotions and preparing well for each appointment do you have any other thoughts you want to share with your listeners like you asked me in in the first section is like if if the training or the certificate was worth it to for my experience i will definitely say yes because i also grow on my job not just like professionally also in my life and spiritually mentally it, or even just my knowledge in the medical sense it's it, it taught me a lot to see life and health and also like you know the family dynamic a lot of immigrants they come here they might not have their uh, kids or family to be with them so a lot of times i see like only single women coming into uh, uh the clinics or like just a man that kind of that usually i see a lot more women instead of men i don't i i wonder and also i know that research showed that a lot of men don't really want to go to hospitals or seek for um health care so i wonder why, <laughs> I wonder why. <laughs> so i do want to remind you guys if anyone's listening so do do listen to to your body and also be aware of uh, the symptoms because a lot of times when they are describing for example for the cancer patient they also describe, oh, about a few months ago, I had that uh, cold, but it didn't get better with with the whole month time. So it's like, it, it, there are some kind of hint from our body. Our body will tell us some things, but we sometimes are too busy not to uh, pay attention to it. Um, I do think this is a job for, you know, people who like to help people and also who have a passion for language and interpretation. And... Um, Strong heart. I don't think I can do this job. It's <laughs> up to you. I mean, there are definitely traumatic experiences. And then that's also why I talk to my therapist. You know, my mental health ther- therapist can keep things confidential. It's very important for interpreters to keep everything confidential as well. Of course. Yeah. So uh, if I have another person I can talk to, or not to mention any name and places to just talk about the experience it actually helps me a lot because it could be tiring and and exhausting over time um but i i i do uh thank god for you know i don't really take that much emotion to my own life i will think about it i feel sad for maybe a few days and then i move on it's just like um yeah, it's, I, I guess that's just my personality. So I do thank God for giving me, me that personality to move on easily, I guess. Um, I remember there was a listener asking me what the goals of uh, interpretation is definitely to get the language through. And of course, the meaning and the, and the language itself, it has to be 
uh, relevant and loyal to the the first language. But I felt like a lot of immigrants also take us like a comfort. When we go into the room with them, they feel like there is a person who can understand them through their native language. And I feel there's a privilege for me to be in that space with them because I can support those people. Usually there are not many happy stories in the hospitals, right? Unless it's like, yeah, it's like everything's cleared and uh, cancer free, that kind of thing. Or you're, you're better and you can take care of yourself now. But a lot of times they're not that happy moments. So if I can actually be there to support immigrants um, and also to see uh, in different phases of life that they're walking through, it, I, I really think that's the, it's kind of the reward back to me. So I can be there not just to help them and on the other side, I can grow as a person as well. That's a great perspective that even though, you know, it's a job, you're doing it as a job, but you get a sense of, um, in a way of serving, that you're serving others and also it helps you to grow as a person. Uh, I understand that, you know, as an interpreter, especially, you know, a professional, you can't really add your stuff when you're conveying the message. It has to be very uh, focused to exactly what has been spoken has to be interpreted. And you, it's great that you mentioned that you as an interpreter can uh, mm -hmm. actually pause and tell, hey, this is an interpreter speaking. I think it could be a better way of explaining. So mm -hmm. that that's a great um I would say a venue or an opportunity for you to f to cover the gap. Yeah. 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 Cool. Yeah. Cool. All right, guys. So thank you everyone for listening to today's episode. I I hope you enjoyed all these stories as I did. And thanks to all the listeners who shoot these questions ping that she could cover in, in this episode in case if there are more questions you have you can type them down in the comment if you're um, watching it on youtube or facebook ad or the, any place where you can write the comments and if you have a lot more questions we might even come up with a second episode for medical interpretation and in the future we ping might even have uh, stories about different kind of interpretation and that would be great thank you for listening bye okay before you put the bloopers i need to hear thanks for listening to chai with ping if you think someone will benefit from this episode don't forget to share it with them you can also follow us on Facebook and Instagram. If you like my show, you can buy me some chai with small donations. Details are in the episode notes. Till next time. Recording. You are say you you're <laughs> Did you say you were talking? You pulled no, the mic from me. I thought, are you going to start? Sure. You can start. <laughs> I have some more stories, but I just don't know. Well, before you do that, okay, cut this whole crap. Okay. I think these stories were really good, and uh, and I think it only scratched the surface, but okay, cut this crap too. Do you have questions for me?